the Lord inspired him during this time that this church and his pastor led this church to worship the Lord other than just singing. Now, of course, singing is a part of worship. But, of course, we must understand that it's more than that. And that is what the Lord laid upon his heart. Listen to these words again, what he said. He says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord for the things that I have made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I want you to understand that's exactly what worship is all about. We need to come to understand that God created us to worship him. And I'm so afraid that the average Christian today does not understand what worship is all about. We think that if we dress a certain way, come to church, sit in a certain way, and we participate in a certain way, that when we leave, we have worship. My friend, you don't come to church to worship. You come to bring your worship to church. You should have already been worshiping before you ever gotten here. We come together corporately to bring our worship and our praise together to the Lord Jesus Christ. There has been a tremendous, tremendous crisis among churches today between contemporary and traditional types and styles of churches and styles of worship. And we get so caught up in that trap that we fail to realize that it is not contemporary, it's not traditional, it is Jesus. And that is who we've come to worship. Now, what we do, of course, we have instruments, we have a piano, we have an organ, we have other instruments, We have a sound system. We have lights. We have all that. We think that it's a part of worship. But I want you to understand, those things cannot worship. They are just instruments that manifests our worship. And that's what we need to understand here today. The last positive command in the Bible was Revelation 22, verse 19, or verse 9. And it said this, worship God. One of your great responsibilities as an individual is understanding what worship is all about. In this passage of Scripture we have before us in the fourth chapter of John, Jesus, who, of course, none other can describe what worship is about any better than he, describes to this lady what worship is all about. So with your Bibles open, I invite you to stand with me in John chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 19. I want you to listen very carefully with me today. As Jesus begins to talk to this lady about worship. Listen to what he says. This woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place For one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship 
what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Did you see verse 23? Let's read that again. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Now notice this. He makes a very radical but a very emphatic statement here. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Isn't that amazing? He never mentions anything about singing. He never mentions anything about dress. He never mentions anything about a place. He never mentions anything about instruments. All those kinds of things that we think that brings worship together. He never mentions that. Only thing he mentions that we worship him in spirit and truth. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us this morning the desires of the Father, and that is to worship Him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul. Help us, dear Lord, to be people of worshipers, ones that recognize the sovereignty and the lordship of the Father of our life. And so, Father, we pray that you will manifest yourself through the Scriptures and through the power of the Holy Spirit that we might come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The problem with so many people today, we come to church to see what we can get out of that church, out of that service. That's the reason why a lot of people will go away and say, well, I didn't get anything out of that service. It's not what you get out of it, it's what you put in. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here today. How do you come into the house of the Lord to worship Him? How do you demonstrate a life of worship 24-7? How do we worship the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Lord lays down some simple guidelines here today that I want to share with you and I want you to see Because if we are going to recognize God's desires, and not only his desires, but what he deserves and demands of our worship, we must understand what worship is all about. And that's what I want us to look at today. There's three simple truths that the Lord Jesus Christ shares with this lady. First of all, I want you to notice with me in verses 19 through 22, he says, first of all, be flexible where you worship. Be flexible where you worship. Listen to what he says. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. 
And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. The background of the setting of the story is is that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan was one that has been uh, married to an Assyrian and that they were part Jew and a part Assyrian. In other words, the Jews looked upon them as half-breeds. They were even called as dogs. Jews did not like Samaritans. And that's the reason that even as many Jews would never go into the place of Samaria. And that here you began to recognize that there are people that were half Jew and half Gentile. The Jews felt like that in order to worship, you must come to Jerusalem to a specific place called the temple. Well, they would not allow the Samaritans to come into the temple to worship. And so what the Samaritans did, that they, up on the mountain, a garrison, they had a place of what they called as worship. They had the idea that you could only worship God in a specific place, whether it was on the mountain of garrison or was it in the temple of Jerusalem. I find it interesting. Jesus said, it's not a place, but it is who you worship that is what is important. And he begins to bring this out because when this woman raised the question, he gave her an answer that absolutely blew her mind. Listen to what he says in verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And notice what he says. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jesus was giving her a revolutionary thought that worship is not a matter where you are, but worship is a matter of who you know. And that is what is so important for us to understand, that we think that it is a specific place that is of the importance. Jesus says, listen, it's not the place, but it's the person that you were worshiping. There was a time as the Jewish community felt that you must worship the Lord in the temple. And you cannot worship him in any other place. I find it interesting. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for the people. But in the New Testament, God had a people for his temple. My friend, I want you to understand, you are a temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So, my friend, Jesus is reminding this lady that she and that we are believers that we are to worship the Lord through our temple, which is called our body. So often we talk about the church as the house of God. Well, of course it is the house of God. 
And I certainly want you, when you come into the house of the Lord, to recognize his presence. So many times we'll welcome our guests, but often overlook to realize that our greatest guest is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we should welcome him into our fellowship to have freedom to demonstrate and to manifest himself in the midst of his people. But oh, friend, I want to remind you that the church is not only the house of God, but you are the house of God as well. And that I, my worship does not consist of coming to church just at 1030 on Sunday morning. And it stops at 12 o'clock that afternoon. But my friend, I want you to understand, every day of my life should be an element of worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, worship is no longer simply an event. It's an ongoing experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship is a lifestyle that my life demonstrates that Jesus Christ is Lord and Lord of all. But so many times people think that I cannot worship unless I go to church just on Sunday. My friend, I want you to understand that's a part of your worship, but it is not all of your worship. And so, therefore, we must come to understand this. The word worship literally means, comes from the old English word, worth-ship. That he, Jesus Christ, is worth my worship. And that through my life and through my experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, there on the job, there in the school, there in the marketplace, that I am to be demonstrating my life of service and worship to him. Friend, when you're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't help not to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. When he has manifested himself in such a manner as being spirit-filled, all of a sudden you begin to realize that Christ is, is manifesting himself. And so through your worship, you are demonstrating his lordship of your life. So worship is a lifestyle and not just a one-time-a-week experience. But Jesus does something else. I find it interesting. He says, not only be flexible in where you worship, that I don't worship just at church, but I worship at home, I worship at school, I worship on my job, I worship in every area of my life. But he says, secondly, look in verse 23. He says, you need to be focused on who you worship. Now, that's very important. I think a lot of people worship worship. They worship style. They worship this particular way. They think that in order to worship the Lord today, we got to be contemporary. Others think if we worship the Lord, we've got to be traditional. It's neither one, my friend. It's neither one. That is just a style that congregations develop. And it's always because of what our preference is. Your preference may be different than my preference. And my preference should be, might be different than your preference. And so it's not the style that is important. But it is who you're worshiping. That is who you need to keep in front of you. Listen to what he says in verse 23. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking 
such to worship. What an incredible statement that Jesus makes to this lady. He says, the Father is seeking people to worship him. God is actually looking for individuals to worship him. He wants to be worshipped. He deserves to be worshipped. And therefore, my friend, we come to obey the Father. The French have this proverb, a good meal ought to begin with hunger. My dad used to say something like this, when you're hungry, anything tastes as good. And you know what the Holy Spirit does? He puts in the heart of a believer a hunger to worship the Lord. He puts in the heart of a believer a thirst that nothing will satisfy him unless he's worshiping. Did you realize that one of the reasons that God has saved you is in order that you will worship him? Not only to give you life, not only to give you eternal life, but to give you a relationship with him. And in through that relationship, you will develop a hunger. My friend, that's why I enjoy in the mornings when I get up taking my Bible, spending some time with the Lord in prayer as well as in Scripture. Why do I do that? Do I do that because I feel like I have to? Do I do that just because I feel like that I'm expected to do that? Or do I do that because I have a hunger? I have a hunger of wanting to know God. I have a hunger to wanting to allow God to manifest himself in my heart. And as that hunger is began to be expressed, I began to recognize I have a heart that yearns to worship him. God is looking for people that are hungry for righteousness. God is looking for people that who is hungering and thirsting after God to be able to worship him. But notice what he says. I find this interesting. He's not only looking for worshipers, but he's looking for true worshipers. In other words, that tells me if he's looking for true worshipers, there must be some what is known as false worshipers. Now, that raises the question. Whose father is he to be worshipped? Whose father is he talking about? He's talking about none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to know the father, you got to be one of his children. And if you're one of his children, you know the Father. You have a relationship with the Father. And so therefore, there's people today are worshiping God that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to say something very radical. And that is, my friend, you cannot worship the Father if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot. And the important fact is, is that I know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through the Lord Jesus Christ, he has allowed me to be born into the family of God. 
as I am born into the family of God, I am introduced to my Father. And my friend, that's why I can pray a prayer such as this. Our Father, my Father, which are in heaven. Because, my friend, it becomes a personal, personal relationship. But Jesus says something I find interesting in verse 22. Listen to what he says. He says, but you worship what you do not know. Did you realize that statement is true for so many so-called worshipers in the world today? My friend, I want you to understand, the Muslim cannot worship the Father. The Buddhists cannot worship the Father. The Hindus cannot worship the Father. They worship a God that they do not know, but not so with a child of God. We know who we're worshiping, my friend. To worship the Father, you must know the Father. And that's the reason the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many has received him, to them he gave the rights to become what? The children of God of God to those who have believed in him, a personal relationship. That's why, my friend, that we must understand the connection of worship and evangelism. Have you ever thought about the connection? You know what God wants us to do? He wants us to go out and to evangelize the lost so that they will become God worshipers. They'll become the father worshipers because of that relationship with this Lord that we know as Jesus Christ. It's a matter of focus, that I'm focusing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important to realize that my worship does not depend upon my style, it does not depend upon the way I'm dressed. It does not depend upon the place where I'm at. It does not depend upon the procedure, but it focuses upon who I am worshiping. So worship is not primarily what you get out of it. Worship is primarily what you put into it. And so, therefore, I encourage you today to come to church today on a Sunday morning with a great attitude, an attitude that may be radically different than what it has been in the past. I'm coming today to bring my offering of worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. It will revolutionize your life. But we have this matter of focus. We think, just like the Jews, I can't worship until 1030 on Sunday morning. I can't worship unless I sing the songs that I feel like that pleases me. I can't worship unless the music is not as loud and that it's quiet and reverent. Friend, I want you to understand, all those things is a matter of preference. And it has absolutely nothing to do with worship. Worship is who we're worshiping, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the style, not the place, not the song. But there's a third thing that he brings up that I think is even more radical. And that is, thirdly, be faithful in the way you worship. Now, we're going to get down to some brass tacks here as we think about summarizing what worship in a simple statement is. I find it interesting that Jesus makes a statement 
that revolutionized the life of this dear woman. Listen to what he says. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him, how? In spirit and truth. Two ways that we worship him. Now, I find it interesting. He doesn't say anything about music. He doesn't say anything about style. He doesn't even say anything about dress. But he says that two dynamic, important truths to worship is in spirit and in truth. So in other words, he has condensed our worship in what I call scriptural worship and also spiritual worship. Let's look at this for a few moments. He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. Now, we understand, if you've been a believer very long, that God is triune, the trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, man is a trinity. You think about it just for a moment. Man, of course, is a body, is a soul, and is a spirit. Jesus is saying that we worship him with our spirit through the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm talking about? What I'm trying to say is, is that I worship the Father through the Holy Spirit, by my Spirit. Now, as I began to think about that, that comes down to remind me that it's not that I come to a right place at a right time and do a right thing. I come to a point of worshiping Him through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's the problem that we have today. And the problem is that we think that our worship has to do with our feelings. Sometimes it certainly affects our feelings. But friend, I want you to understand, it goes far beyond feelings. That's why we come to a house of the Lord and we leave and say, well, I didn't feel like that God spoke to me today. I didn't get anything out of that service today simply because my feelings were not affected. Now, I do believe that the Spirit of God demonstrates His work, and yes, it certainly affects our feelings, but I want you to understand, worship is not all about feelings. It is about the Spirit of of the living Lord in our lives. There are those who worship the Lord with their soul, with their feelings. But God is spirit, and you must worship him in spirit. I'm reminded of what Isaiah said 8,000 years before the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to this lady. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, listen to these words. The Lord says, therefore, the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but I have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. What did the Lord say? What did the scriptures mean by this? He's talking about people who thinking that they come to a certain place, they dress a certain way, and they do a certain thing, and therefore they worship. What he's talking about here is saying that it's not that, 
but he finds something radically different. God doesn't look at what we demonstrate on the outside, but what we possess on the inside. That is what's so important for us to understand. It's not the outward appearance, but it's the inward possession of the Spirit of God. So, when the Bible talks about that I am not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit of God. If you'll continue looking upon those scriptures, you'll begin to realize that the only way you can worship the Father is through the Holy Spirit and when He is in complete control of your life. So, Father, so we must recognize the importance of that we worship Him in spirit. But he goes a step further. He says that we are to, there should be scriptural worship. He says that we're to worship him in truth. Truth. What is he talking about? He's talking about a God of truth according to the truth of God. A lot of people who worship a God of their own designs do not find that God in the Bible. I find it interesting. There's a place in Japan that you can go and they call it the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas. And you can go into this place and you can pick out a particular Buddha. They're all different to a certain degree. And so, therefore, you identify that Buddha with your own lifestyle or your own characteristic of your, of your personality. And so you pick out that Buddha, and you worship that Buddha. You know, I find there's a lot of people today that are worshiping God that is not the God of this Bible. For example, I hear people say, well, the God that I worship is a God that who accepts everybody. We're all part of the family of God. That's not what the Bible says. I hear some people say, well, the God that I worship have made homosexuals the way that they are, and therefore he accepts them as the way that they are. That's not the God that we're talking about. That's not God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I serve a God that if you live good, you try to do what's right, that you can go to heaven. That's not what this Bible speaks. So, my friend, I want you to understand, there's a lot of gods that people worship today is not the God of truth. Jesus said, I am the way and what? The truth and the life. In other words, my friend, he is the God of this Bible. Therefore, friend, we must come to recognize that I have a choice. Do I worship a God of my speculation? In other words, do I worship a God that I think that he acts the way that I think that he acts <clears throat> and he accepts the things that I think he should accept? Or do I serve a God of revelation? A God that has revealed himself through the word of God. A God who has revealed himself through the Son of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated in every aspect of his life the true characteristics of a holy, holy God. The Apostle Paul made a statement one time. He said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice that brings to us the acknowledgement of surrender. Do you know what worship really is all about? It is surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is surrendering my time, that my life, that God has given to me a plan And that I am to carry out that plan according to his will. But God not only has given me that time, but he's given me my talents. The gifts of God. Why did God give you the gifts that he has given you? So that you can serve him. So that you can surrender to him. That's why I do not understand. When you invite people to serve the Lord in a specific capacity, they said, I don't want to serve God. I do not want to serve in that position. I am retired. My friend, I don't find that word retirement in the word of God. But not only that, but I surrender my ties to the Lord. If you really want to worship, my friend, one of the greatest moments of worship is when that offering plate is being passed by. You're presenting your first fruit. You are presenting and recognizing that Christ is Lord of your life. And you're demonstrating your worship by your giving. Nobody should ever have to beg a believer to be a faithful tither. It is the command of God. And my friend, you'll never, ever be a true worshiper of God if you don't tithe. You'll never do it. And that's the reason why we need to realize It's not about style. It's not about the type of songs that we sing. It's not what I wear. It's not the place where I go. But it's who I'm worshiping. It's why I'm worshiping. And it is a demonstration of my worshiping. I remember hearing about a story about this man. He was a construction worker. And that he was working down the street from the community church. He came in one day to the church office and asked the pastor, May I spend about 30 minutes a day on my lunch hour in your sanctuary? And the pastor said, well, of course you can come in. Realizing that is his time for lunch. I wonder if he's coming into the house of the Lord to eat his lunch. And so the curiosity got the best of the pastor. And the pastor snuck in one morning and he began to look and to observe and eavesdrop upon this man. He happened to notice that this man was at the altar. He had taken his hard hat off and put it down on the altar. And he began to listen to the man. And the man said something like this. 
Lord, this is Johnny. I haven't come to ask for anything specifically. I've come realizing that I'm not a wealthy man, realizing I'm not an educated man. I can barely read and write. But, Lord, you've saved me. And, Lord, I just want to come today to thank you. And I've come today to bow before your presence to worship you. You know what? We need some Johnnies like that. We need some Johnnies. Not coming before you to ask for anything specifically or wanting anything specifically. But I just want to worship you today. Are you a worshiping believer? Are you a believer that allowed the Holy Spirit in your life to worship the true living God? Are you on a day-by-day basis bowing before His presence and worshiping Almighty God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in order to do that, you've got to know him, as I said earlier. You're here today, and you say, well, pastor, how do I know the Father? How can I have that type of relationship? Oh, my friend, the Father has made the way so clear and such a wonderful way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except by me today. Would you invite Christ into your life? Allow him to become Lord of your life. Believer, how often do you worship the Lord? Do you wait for Sunday morning? Or do you do it on Monday morning? Do you worship the Lord on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and then bring your worship corporately to the house of the Lord? I encourage you to take a look at your heart And ask the question, am I a true worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord Jesus,